Hello, everyone. I'm Marco Congrega, Head of Data Science Innovation at RayImpact. And in this Control Alt Data podcast, I'm joined by Christopher Marquis. Chris is the Samuel C. Johnson Professor in Sustainable Global Enterprise and Professor of Management at the Cornell University Johnson College of Business. He is focused on social innovation and change, doing business in China, and how companies can have a positive impact on society. Today, we discuss the evolution of the B Corp movement. Chris has uh, recently researched and published a new book called Better Business, how the B Corp movement is remaking capitalism, and uh, I'm excited to dig into some of the underlying trends. Chris, the pleasure to have you on the podcast. Uh, thanks so much, Marco. Great to be with you. Excellent. So, so to start, maybe you can give our listeners your potted bio, and uh, for those who are not familiar with the concept, a uh, brief overview of uh, what B Corps are. Sure. Uh, so as you mentioned, I uh, am a professor at Cornell in the business school. Uh, a lot of the research and writing I do is on sustainable business, social innovation. Before Cornell, I taught at Harvard Business School for 10 years. And this is where my connection with the B Corp movement really started. Actually, I was teaching a class on broadly speaking, sustainable business, uh, probably around 2009, 2010. We we're studying large companies like you know, Goldman Sachs, IBM, and what they did in the sustainability and social responsibility realm. And one student said in class today, you know, the HBS model is sort of a lot of discussion and case study um, method said, you know, we should be studying B corporations, not these large companies that have sustainability, you know, programs as an add-on. And I had never heard of the B Corp movement at that point, um, sort of embarrassing as sort of the expert professor in, in the domain. So I sort of went back to my office, Googled it, um, got in touch with them. And actually in 2010, wrote an HBS case study on B Lab, which is the certifying body of B corporations. And, you know, just quickly what B corporations are. So these are companies that are certified for their social and environmental performance. They go through a rigorous assessment of their ESG uh, performance. Uh, and then if they so wish, they can become um, certified. A number of companies that your listeners know about from, you know, Patagonia, Allbirds, you know, Danone, the, the, the global, um, you know, dairy and, and consumer products company, uh, King Arthur Flower. There's a number of companies that have gone through the certification to really sort of put their, you know, sort of money where their mouth is, so to speak, you know, and walk the talk of sustainability. Excellent. So maybe to start, we can kind of uh, try and unpack the subtitle of the book and address this uh, remaking of capitalism. Sure. Um, yeah. So, so as you mentioned, you know, it's sort of uh, the, the the title of the book is "Better Business: How the B Corp Movement Is Remaking Capitalism," and that was a pretty conscious title. Uh, you know, this idea of remaking capitalism is something that has been, you know, in the public discussion in the news recently. You know, the Business Roundtable CEOs of the 200 largest companies in the United States recently called on companies to, to really shift their purpose from just focusing very narrowly on shareholders to focusing on all stakeholders. The World Economic Forum, also its 2020 meeting was focused on stakeholder capitalism. And that's really in many ways what I mean by sort of remaking capitalism. It's shifting to a much more stakeholder driven uh, a a form of business where companies are accountable for their ESG, environmental, social, and governance uh, metrics. And, you know, why I titled it Better Business is that actually by going through these processes that I describe in the book uh, that are oriented around accountability on these issues, uh, I argue that companies can be better run, actually better businesses for the long term. That's great. So, um, that's the, the whole crux of the uh, the whole idea behind B Corps is kind of this um, idea of uh, implementing fiduciary duty beyond stockholders. So uh, maybe let's try and uh, discuss the kind of implementation behind that idea and how that's going to benefit businesses and all the other stakeholders. Yeah, sure. So you know, I think that there's in many ways two aspects to that. Um, so one is, you know, companies having a sort of articulated purpose beyond just shareholder meeting shareholders quarterly numbers. So, you know, some companies it's environmental sustainability, some company it's in their supply chain, some companies it's, you know, focusing on their uh, communities. And, 
one of the things that the, 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 this B Corp community has done is actually create a new corporate form called a benefit corporation. So this is akin to C Corp, S Corp, LLC. There's now a new corporate form called a benefit corporation where companies actually do have a fiduciary duty beyond their shareholders. Interesting. So it, 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 when, you, when you think about uh, incorporating as a B Corp and going through this rigorous certification process, um, can can these uh, can the implicit and explicit costs of this certification process actually encumber a business? And is would the process be different across sectors and industries? Yeah, good good question. Uh, so yes, I mean there is a cost. Um, you know there is a cost to the certification, which is scaled based on size of the company. You know, you know uh, companies don't find it super onerous, but there is a big, particularly initially upfront, you know, sort of management costs because many of these items companies haven't tracked before. Uh, so, you know, do, companies do find it, you know, somewhat onerous to actually go through a process. Um, many of the companies though tell me that, you know, it's so valuable to really understand, you know, the nuance of how their business operates that, you know, it actually has a long-term benefit. And this is what, you know, scores of academic studies have found. You know, if you read Mr. Fink's letter, the last one, he has a link to a number number of these studies that show the companies that are actually, you know, sort of tracking and measuring ESG, it actually helps their performance uh, over the long-term. Very much, again, as I mentioned, you know, long-term risk management, uh, management quality, uh, et cetera. It is, of course, very, very important to scale this uh, and, uh, and slice and dice it in some ways based on, you know, industry, based on geography, and based on size of the company. And so the B Impact Assessment, the, the assessment for, you know, B corporations actually does that. So, you know, if you're an investment bank and you have, you know, you know, carbon, uh, you know, um, sort of car, car, uh, carbon expenses based on your office, maybe people traveling, you know, very different than a chemical company or a manufacturing company where the actual operations have a lot more sort of environmental impact. So I think that, that as of now, there's about 75 different flavors of the assessment. Um, you know, once you factor in sort of industry differences, ge geography differences and size differences. So there is some sort of a materiality map embedded in the process thing. Exactly. So, so I should I should have used that term uh, when I described it. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Excellent. So maybe maybe to kind of bring this down to earth, we can touch on a few details around, say, Danone or Unilever of Patagonia, which is one of the highest scoring B Corps. How how, how does this uh, landscape actually look as the company goes through the certification process, and what are some of the most important points that they touch on? Yeah, so I think that you know, so a, you know, good example as you mentioned, sort of Patagonia is um, is is a well known B Corp. It's it's one of the larger B Corps that actually. Um, uh, I think it's a multi billion dollar sales company. Uh, so if you look across the major um, sections, so you know the, the the B impact assessment is divided into uh, consumers, workers, governance, community. Uh, an environment. Uh, so, you know, Patagonia, is, you know, is a company that's really focused on the environment, also very much an activist company. Uh, so, you know, they are, you know, you know, sort of sending teams to Congress to, to testify or to protest on, on various issues. And so, you know, you know, Patagonia is actually very, very high in its environmental score, very high in its community score. One of the aspects it's it's rather low on is actually its consumer score, and I'm not sure why that is. I think people are passionate about Patagonia, but one of the things that they actually do is they actively encourage consumers not to buy their products. Um, you know, then Black Friday, sort of the biggest shopping day of the year, they take out a full page ad and say, you know, don't don't buy our products today. Uh, actually, and I'll, and you know, because they're trying to actually encourage consumers to consume less, but consume better. Uh, so, you know, that might be the reason why, you know, Danone, a little, a little bit interesting, uh, 
uh, a color. So that they, that that Danone's French um, headquartered company, you know, thirty billion dollar or thirty billion euro company, so gigantic. It's actually in the process of certifying all of its subsidiaries. Uh, so it actually itself is not certified yet. It's committed by 2025 as a global brand to be um, certified. Evian, uh, for example, one of the subsidiaries of Danone is a certified B Corporation, just recently certified. Uh, Danone North America, which, you know, I'm in New York and, you know, you look in my refrigerator, sort of Oikos yogurt, um, uh, other Danone yogurt brands, they, uh, they actually are certified B Corporation, certified uh, B Corp products. So, you know, the Danone North America, $6 billion company, Evian, and about, you know, 30, I think, other Danone uh, com subsidiaries are certified. And it's very complex for very large companies to be certified, as you can tell. So all the subsidiaries would have to be certified. And then actually they have to go through sort of a headquarters um, certification uh, as well. So it is something where it's really very rigorous. And I think that, you know, it is an attempt to really avoid greenwashing. And if companies are going to say that they're actually being sustainable, uh, they should be accountable for it as well. It might be interesting to talk then about uh, this kind of idea of consumer driven company change versus companies taking action themselves. It sounds like uh, the B Corp movement is very much about the latter. Um, so I'm curious to, to hear how companies come about uh, implementing those changes. Yeah, I think that, I mean, consumers are part of it. You know, this is something where um, I think that, that, that the movement has not had as much success as it has with investors and with changing the laws. I think that, you know, millennials, uh, other folks are very much more conscious consumers now. And there's, you know, studies that show that people want to buy from sustainable, socially responsible, equi equitably produced brands. But actually, um, you know, that trend is just sort of get, getting started. Uh, one of the reasons uh, why a number of companies have told me they become certified is access to capital. So there is actually a large uh, impact investing ecosystem that is well connected into this um, into into this uh, into this community. So there's companies that are actually out there actively looking for businesses with ESG performance. Uh, mainstream investors are also really getting on board. So if you look at you know all the major VCPE firms, you know Kleiner Perkins, KKR, uh, TPG, you know they all actually have. B Corps in their portfolio portfolios. There's been about uh, you know multiple billions. I think last I heard about two to three billion dollars invested in B Corps in the last couple of years, private investment. This then has really started spilling over into the public markets in sort of amazing ways. I mean, it sort of makes sense. I mean, if you're you know, Kleiner Perkins or Andreessen Horowitz, you invest in a B Corp, you're going to want an exit. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I think the, you know, there's been 150, you know, uh, VC investment in B Corps in the last number of years. So all these companies are either going to be bought, you know, in some sort of strategic M&A or go public. And I think this is recently, you know, sort of the tipping point has actually happened on this in the last year. So up until this past year, there was just one public B Corp. It was a company called Laureate. Uh, and in the, last, um, uh, in the last year, there's been over 10. Uh, Lemonade, online insurer, you know, which is one of the best performing IPOs of 2020, kicked this off uh, in July of, of, um, of 2020. Coursera, $6 billion IPO, another example. A number of companies have gone public through SPACs, App Harvest, which is, you know, Martha Stewart on the board and advisor to the company. It's an indoor farming company, you know, because they're producing such high quality vegetables. That's why she's involved, went public through SPAC. A number of companies actually have, um, have converted to benefit corporations. These are existing public companies. Uh, Viva Systems is an example of this. This is a company, cloud computing company, that uh, is 
sort of under cloud computing, particularly for sort of pharmaceutical and healthcare applications. So hugely important in the vaccine drive converted to a public benefit corporation. So, you know, this is something where investors are really, um, you know, taking it on in a way that, you know, they were not taking it on before. So um, I realize uh, it might be a difficult question to answer, but um, as the B Corps become more established over time and the dust settles, so to speak, how do you think their valuations will compare relative to their non B Corp peers? So in other words, do you see indications from the investment community that they would assign an ESG equity premium when valuing such companies? Yeah, that's, 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 a, that's I guess, the 64 thousand dollar question or whatever the, the there used to be a, a u.s um game show called <laughs> called that i mean that, that that's the big uh the big question you know there are a lot of indications that that there is a premium given to these companies um so many of the companies that i've, I've talked to actually many of the companies that have gone, gone public and they're sort of undergoing their roadshow, their investment bankers have done studies of this and suggest that it is neutral at worst most likely positive. Um, we talked before about many of the academic studies that have shown that actually there is an ESG premium, you know, looking broadly speaking across public market firms, not just sort of companies that are really focused uh, on ESG. Uh, and I think, you know, also, if you look at the company's S1s, what they disclose to the um, to, to, to the investors as part of their IPO process, you know, frequently indicate that losing B Corp status is a risk uh, if they were to lose this, because it's very important to the identity, brand, and operations uh, of the companies. All right. So um, I'm curious, what, what do you think is the timeline before B Corp entities become mainstream? Yeah, that, that, that's another really, uh, really good question. I mean, I think that we are close to the tipping point, so to speak. Uh, you know, when you have companies like Danone putting the B Corp logo on all their packaging, billions of, of, of packages, uh, people are going to be much more familiar with it. Uh, I think also, you know, with the attention on stakeholder capitalism and ESG, you know, this becomes a much more, you know, sort of integrated into the mainstream type of activity. I, I will say also that, you know, the number of B Corps themselves may actually always be relatively small because it is a very rigorous certification. However, the tools and processes by which companies can become a B Corp, uh, actually, these are things that are used by you know, hundreds of thousands of other companies, not just B Corps. Uh, and it relates to one, something you mentioned before about sort of the investors finding this useful. So there's a number of banks around the world, like two that come to mind, uh, BDC, Business Development Bank of Canada, Bank of Columbia, actually use the B Impact Assessment to assess their potential lendees. Uh, so this is a, you know, these are tools that many, many companies are using beyond just B Corps. This benefit corporation legal framework actually, yeah, used by tens of thousands of companies, you know, not just B Corp. So I do think that, you know, this idea of actually having tools and processes for companies to be more authentically transparent and accountable uh, to ESG processes, I think is only going to, you know, take off um, in, in the future. Interesting. So uh, given, given how quickly this uh, trend is developing and uh, how um, um, meaningful this trend really is, um, how do you think another big economic crisis might impede this positive trend? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, the, 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 the one study of B Corps um, that, that I know somewhat well it actually was done in the 2000. 8 2007 2008 financial crisis and soon after you know companies started converting to b corps uh found that actually b corps were more likely to survive the crisis and then grow at a faster rate compared to other similar uh businesses in the recent pandemic economic crisis that we had actually record numbers of companies were converting to b corps uh it seems that you know, when there are these crises, people question the sort of underlying assumptions of our system. You know, 
so, you know, and look for ways to have a more resilient and sustainable business. And that, that actually drives many people to this type of solution. So maybe it uh, would be interesting to discuss some of the struggles the B Corp movement experienced over its development. Sure. I think, you know, there's two um, things that really come to mind. I think that a persistent one has been consumer awareness. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, like I mentioned, I think there's been a tremendous amount of progress in the investment markets. Uh, tremendous amount of progress getting large companies to commit. These were things when I first started teaching and researching B Corps, people thought like, oh, this is good for companies that are small or good for companies that are like sort of controlled by, you know, a small group of private investors that believe in this. But, you know, the expansion into like large companies like Danone, expansion into the public markets, you know, I think it's a big success. Uh, I think that the legal changes, you know, now like 15 countries around the world, you know, 38 states have this new corporate form, I think is a huge uh, success. But I do think that we need to get consumers to care about this, to care about buying from sustainable, equitable uh, and socially responsible companies. And I think that, that, that there's a lot of indications that company that people want to, but, you know, actually helping them identify them and actually make those purchases is one of the things where I think there's been, you know, not as much, uh, progress, you know, another thing, which I think is really interesting and it is a little bit in the past, but actually the B Corp movement lost a number of its very early sort of poster child, so to speak, like Etsy, uh, Warby Parker were initially B Corps, the honest company. And they ended up decertifying. And the reason why is actually related to this new legal type of company that, that came in. So, uh, you know, when they certified, it was before there was this corporate form called a benefit corporation. And then when this corporate form was created, you know, B Lab said all companies who are B Corps are required to be this benefit corporation form. Uh, and that is actually, you know, for their investors, for their board, too much of a risk uh, to take. Uh, nowadays, I've talked to some of these companies and they say, because you know, public markets are clearly supporting this, you know, companies are converting this Viva systems, which I mentioned, you know, employee, excuse me, investor vote to convert to a benefit corporation passed with over 99%. Um, uh, you know, many of the, these B Corps are going public. So I think this is something that wouldn't be a hurdle now, but it was actually a challenge early on. And I, and I actually, you know, it says a lot to me that that the B Corp and the movement and the B Lab actually stuck to their guns and said, you know, this certification has to mean something and we'll lose some of our early supporters uh, in order to keep this really uh, rigorous. And I think that, you know, nowadays, from what I understand, one of the early companies that actually ended up stepping away from the B certification is going to come back and going to go public um, soon. I don't know what that is. I've only heard sort of rumors about this, but but I think that will be a big deal because it will sort of validate that, you know, this reason, this hurdle that they had initially has now been overcome in the public markets. Curious, I'm not sure if you know this, but uh, what would it take for, say, Apple to be to become uh, B Corp certified? Yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, um, for a company as large as Apple, it would be a very difficult operational challenge. Uh, I don't think it's insurmountable. Uh, I don't know enough about Apple's business, but, you know, clearly the environmental footprint of the company would need to be examined extensively. And from what I understand, you know, they are, you know, Apple is a pretty, res you know, responsible company uh, as far as its environment, uh, environmental footprint, how it treats its employees, how it treats its, you know, supply chain. Uh, but it, you know, this has been a challenge for larger companies because of how operationally difficult it is. And actually there's been a number of companies that have come together uh, as a cohort to try to understand how large companies can become B Corps. So Danone, who I mentioned uh, is one of these, Natura, which is a Brazilian cosmetics company, as the name suggests, it sort of makes natural cosmetics. It, it recently bought Avon, 
Uh, so Avon, you know, the U.S. direct sales cosmetics company, six billion dollar company, is going to become uh, a B Corp. The Body Shop they also own. So this Natura is one another large company. Uh, it's publicly traded, New York Stock Exchange traded company, along with Danone. And there's some other companies, actually mostly from Europe and Latin America. You know, from steelmakers to retailers to fragrance companies uh, that are actually all working together on developing a model so that larger companies can also, you know, become B Corps. And so I think that work will be helpful for a company like Apple, where they to think about it, uh, think about becoming B Corp. Uh, but, you know, I, I certainly encourage them to, I mean, it's interesting uh, when I think, you know, Apple CEO, Tim Cook, um, you know, Jeff Bezos, uh, the head of Alphabet and, there's a fourth one. They the four big tech CEOs went to Capitol Hill. Actually, Jamie Raskin, who is a, is a U.S. congressman, asked them if they had thought about becoming a B Corp or a benefit corp, and there was actually silence. So, so, the, so I don't think that they've uh, thought about it yet. But, um, but, but I think it's good that they were asked this because it does suggest that you know, with all the disinformation. Uh, in other uh, issues that sort of systemic economic issues that people are pinning on the technology company, if they were to become a B Corp, it would be one way to help them both uh, reform their corporate operations and culture, but also show to the public that they were taking their responsibility society seriously. Yeah, it's clearly a very interesting, uh, a very dynamic uh, space. And uh, I think it's a, Makes sense to kind of uh, see, have there been any meaningful developments in the B Corp movement since uh, your book's publication in 2020, given how quickly things are changing? Yeah, definitely. Sure, no, I mean, this is really, you know, so when I wrote the book, when I handed it into the publisher um, as, as of, um, you know, it was actually March of 2020, sort of right as the pandemic was, uh, you know, uh, unfortunate furling there was one public uh b corp you know by the time it came out there was five uh now there's over 10 and like all birds has signaled they're going to be doing an ipo so that will be another one there's other companies that have signaled they're going to be going public as b corps actually if you look around the world there's actually 25 companies from you know australia to brazil to to play to europe france so this is something the public markets embrace of companies with a social mission is something I never would have guessed. I would say that, you know, 2020 was the year of the B Corp IPO. Fascinating. So, well, Chris, we're coming up on time here and uh, I'm becoming mindful of your time. And um, this was a really fascinating discussion. Uh, your book is a captivating read, tackles a series of relevant questions, and I hi highly recommend people read it. Chris, I appreciate your time. Thank you very, very much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks so much, Marco. It was really great to talk. Pleasure. As always, if any of our listeners have comments or suggestions, reach out to us at ravenpack at info at ravenpack.com.